in that week. I think it's 14 hours one way. Um, so it, um, he, he's basically in a vehicle for approximately 30 hours within a week. So when you tried the driving, was it you doing the driving or was it Ms. McKnight? Um, well, it was actually uh, myself, Mr. William Booth, and Ms. McKnight, and my partner, Cassie Criado. Uh, that way we could switch who was driving uh, for safety reasons because it was, a, it was a, you know, a fairly long drive. Thank you. Uh, Judge, pass the witness. Speakers. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Conley. I don't have anything else for Mr. Huddleston, Judge. Ms. Vickers, your next witness. Uh, that's all the witnesses I'm calling for this particular motion. I assume we're going to do something different and separate with the mediation motion. Okay. All right, Mr. Conley, would you like to call a witness? Just briefly, Judge, I'll call my client. All right, Ms. Saul, can you please unmute yourself? Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony that you give in this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, Your Honor. You may put your hand down. And what is your name? Aaron Sewell. All right, you may proceed, Mr. Connolly. Good morning, Ms. Sewell. Uh, are you in Georgia today? Yes, sir. All right. And I'm just going to kind of go straight to the, the point that we're here discussing today, the extended summer possession. Uh, have you tried to make uh, your son available to his father for a lengthy period of time this summer? Yes, sir. All right. And have you basically proposed a period over 30 days up to 42 days? Yes, sir. All right. Are, do you have some concerns about your son being gone for, from you so quickly for that long of a period of time? Yes, sir. Tell me just a little bit about those concerns. I'm concerned the the medication that he is on is only a 30 day dose. And due to the fact that it cannot be mailed or anything like that, and also he has doctor's appointments that he needs to, you know, go to to help him. Um I'm concerned that him not being around his brother and sister that but both his brother and sister miss him very dearly and that uh, he's always been around, you know, them for the last three years. And <clears throat> during the time I, he has been at his father's, I have talked to my son on uh, Zoom calls. Um, three days, I wasn't able to call him. Uh, he wasn't wanting to talk to me. Um, I could understand he was at a church thing, uh, apparently doing a water thing, and I completely understand that. I want him to have as much as fun as possible. I want him to enjoy his time. Okay, and so you're aware that we have a final trial on the merits set for July 17th? Yes, sir. And are you requesting of the court today that essentially uh, your son uh, be returned to you the week before the trial. Yes, sir. So that would be about July 9th would be that Sunday before. That'd be about eight days, I guess, if it was a Sunday transfer before the final trial. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And then would it be your intention to travel back to Texas for the final trial on the 17th with your son? Yes, sir. All right. Um, now there, I don't, I don't want to take too much of the court's time, but you, you had started the process of having your son evaluated by an autism expert. Is that correct? Yes, sir. But the individual that was, you were, you were initially referred to, was she able to complete the full evaluation? No, sir. All right. Are you committed to try to find someone else to finish that evaluation? Yes, sir. He is on the list for Hope Bridge here in Georgia. It's a very good autism place to be diagnosed. They have very good therapy here. Um, I am just waiting on a call from them to get him scheduled done. All right. And, you know, you've spent a lot of time with Peter. 
what sort of things, behaviors have you observed that give you concern that they're that he might fall within the, the autism spectrum? He has a problem with colors and separating his foods. Um, I can give him the same thing, the same type of food, but it could be mixed together and he will not eat it. He won't touch it. Even though he might like it, he has a problem with it. His colors have to be a certain color. Um, also, he is... <sighs> He's, five, he's going to be six next month, but he acts like he is behind. He's an intelligent kid, but he writes his numbers backwards, his ABCs backwards sometimes. And I have talked to his teacher before about it to find out what was going on. I've talked to him, many counselors um, at the school just to find out what was going on due to the fact that I was trying to figure out well, he's a very smart child, why is this happening? And he's kind of behind on certain things. Um, I've been told by a psychiatrist- Your Honor, I'm gonna to object to any testimony about what she's been told, that's hearsay. Sustained. That's, yeah. So we'll just, we'll just stick to things that you've personally observed, but let me just ask you this, Aaron, are you committed to making sure that your son is he sees doctors who can appropriately diagnose whatever is going on in his world. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I'll pass the witness, Judge. Ms. Vickers. Ms. Sewell, what does the possibility that Peter might have autism, we don't know, but what does that have to do with him visiting with his father? It has nothing to do with visiting his father. Um, we have offered him to come up here and pay for all of his expenses to come see his son. Many of times, we have no problem with- Wait, excuse me, let me, let me stop you for a second. When did that happen? Every time Peter had asked, uh, for his father to come up here, well, we said we have no problems of him coming up here. And also, when, back when, when Christmas, did, excuse me, Ms. Soul, let me finish my question. So, let, answer my question. When did that happen? Can you give me a month and a year when when you extended to Mr. Huddleston an invitation where you would pay for his travel and have him come to Georgia to see Peter? When when did that happen? Christmas of 2022, spring break of 2023. Well, okay, well, so you're talking about the visits that have already occurred that we agreed to once the court order, once the court proceedings were going on, the ones that Mr. Huddleston has testified to. That's what you're talking about? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, you talked about his um, medications. Uh, my, Is there some issue with calling in medications if they're needed? to a pharmacy here in Pleasanton or San Antonio? They are a controlled substance and going uh, from state to state is very difficult. Well, have you ever attempted to call and figure out a way to call in a prescription to a pharmacy who is that is local to Mr. Huddleston? Have you tried? Yes, ma'am. They have to have an ID. Um, and he's also on Medicaid here in Georgia. And so the insurance doesn't travel to Texas, unfortunately. Okay, have you given a prescription to Mr. Huddleston to see if he can arrange medications? I have given him the bottles that- hey, but, not, but that's not my question. Have you given him the actual prescription? I'm kind of confused, ma'am. Meaning the, the paper? piece of paper, the piece of paper that the doctor signs that says, this is my prescription. He's getting such and such medication. Have you given that to Mr. Huddleston and worked with him to see about the possibility of medications being available in Texas? They do not write a piece of paper out. They that's not my, that's not my question. That's not my question, Ms. Sewell. Have you 
attempted to give Mr. Huddleston the actual prescription and to see if there's any way to obtain whatever medication has been prescribed here in Texas. Objection. It's a yes just, or no. It's a yes or no she question. Just responded. She didn't have a piece of paper. Uh, so the answer was no. Just to clarify, Ms. Stoll, I mean, why can't he get the prescription drugs here in Texas? Can't you just get the medical providers to provide him with a prescription? He goes to a pharmacy here in Texas. And he may have to pay out of his pocket since it might be uh, not covered by your insurance, but he should be able to get the same prescription here in Texas, right? They already have them ahead of time and they don't write any of the prescriptions out on paper. They all call it in. Right. I know the things have changed where we don't really have paper prescriptions anymore, but still, it, it still begs the question, why can't he just get the pills here in Texas? They have to have an ID and he has to be on the list and he is on the list. Um, but here in Georgia, they have to have an actual ID in person to uh, see it. All right, who are you looking at right now? No one, sir. Okay, there's no one in that room with you right now? No, sir. Okay. All right, next question, Ms. Vickers. All right, so you said something about medical appointments. When are these medical appointments scheduled? He has a, a wellness check and a med checkup in July. I had to cancel when, when, in, when in July, what day? It's on the 20th of July. I had to cancel it due to the court case coming up. Okay, so it's actually after our court date. Yes, ma'am. All right. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Ms. Harkins, do you have any questions? I do, Your Honor. Uh, okay, Ms. Sewell, um, let me get my bearings here. Okay. Um, so the wellness checkup and the, you said a med checkup? Yes, ma'am. Is that, uh, you know, he's, his birthday's in July, right? Yes, ma'am. So are those, you know, like age six appointments? Yes, ma'am. That's, that's a six year appointment. Okay. Um, any appointments in July related to his, uh, the autism diagnosis? Unfortunately, since the autism doctor, uh, Dr. Uh, Courtney, uh, couldn't finish the evaluation. We are on, as I said, we are on a wait list for Hope Bridge to get in. Now that can happen at any time during the month or it could be next week. It could be as soon as I get a call from them. Okay. Um, um, the reason why she had um, canceled out due to the fact that apparently from what she had told me was that she does not do custody battles I explained to her that I'm not here for any, you know, evidence. I'm just seeing what's, you know, what I could do to help my son. I, and she said, because it's a custody battle and a lot of people have been calling her, um, apparently harassing her is what the words were told to me over the phone. Um, apparently playing phone tag. And this was, and I knew that you had called her, um, and then two other people apparently had called her, a lawyer and someone else that was a family member, is what I was told. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, we, it's true that everybody's been trying to get medical records for just yes, a with Peter, right? Yes, ma'am. Repeat and that, please, Ms. Harkins. Uh, everyone has been trying to get medical records to find out what's going on with Peter. Yes, ma'am. And, <clears throat> you know, I was under the impression that Peter is, does have autism, that he has been diagnosed on the high spectrum of autism. Is that correct or not? Yes, ma'am. So he's been to a therapist here that was court ordered by uh, the Georgia courts. Her name is Debbie Chambers. Um, she referred me to River Edge Behavioral, and um, I had talked to them. I've talked to his pediatric uh, primary doctor here, and they told me his primary pediatric. Your Honor, doctor, I'm going to object to any testimony about what a medical professional told her. That's all hearsay. We don't have any. We don't have any expert witnesses to talk about that. We don't have any medical records with the business records affidavit. We don't have any of that. Sustained. Okay, Missile, let me ask you this. 
is it correct that Peter is on some pretty significant medication tailored for autism? Yes, ma'am. He's on a low dose of Risperdal. Okay. Any other medication? He's also on clonidine or clonidine or clonidine. Is that for sleep? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let me uh, talk to you about the uh, Christmas visit and the spring break visit, because I know that you and I spoke after each visit, visit after Peter had returned home. Um, and from what you told me, that transition was, was kind of difficult, right, when Peter would get home. Yes, ma'am. And so tell the judge that what, what Peter's behavior was when he would come back. Peter came home just going crazy pretty much and I guess the best way I can explain it is is that misbehaving jumping around wanting to watch tv he was wanting to take drinks out of our fridge and he drinks water with us we barely rarely rare give him any kind of sugary stuff due to the fact that the medication that he's on he has to drink a lot of water or he gets really bad headaches um he was having nightmares um, when his dad would call him. He did not want me leaving the room anymore. He wanted me to stay there. I told him you needed to talk to your dad. He did not want me leaving whatsoever. Um, I, if, I've tried many times to give him and his dad his own personal spot where they can go into Peter's room and talk with the door closed while my other kids were outside playing or sitting down eating but it started to get to the point where he did not want to leave my side. So I told Peter, you can sit at the kitchen table. I'm right here. If you need me, I'm right here. Um, I'm cleaning the kitchen up. Um, if you need me, you know, mommy's right here pretty much. Um, okay. He was having nightmares really badly um, for a couple of days and just screaming for me. Okay, and now on the, the flip side, you testified to this, and you also told me that when Peter was with Mr. Huddleston, there were times that he didn't want to talk to you at all, right? No, he didn't want to talk to me, and um, it really concerned me a lot due to the fact that, you know, he get, he would run away, and he's like, I don't want to talk to you, I don't want to talk to you, and I'm like, he's always wanted to talk with me. Okay. Um, and this is on Zoom, right? Not yes, it's Zoom or FaceTime? Zoom. Okay. No further questions. Mr. Colley? Just briefly, Judge, and if I may uh, do a screen share, I've actually got some medical records with a BRA that I think might help us get to the bottom of something pretty quickly. And yes. provided, I don't recall receiving a business records affidavit, which just has to be on file for a certain number of days prior to the admission into court. Do you, what records are we talking about? This is the notice that we subpoenaed from Dr. Courtney, which I believe you signed off on okay. and we received, I think on 523, so just recently, but I'm, I was under the impression we've already provided it to you. You can inspect it. You can review it. Um, well, normally business records affidavits, if you're using the affidavit, they have you have to file a notice and then I, it has to be on file. I believe it's... I, I was under the impression it was on file. I thought so. I, I got it. I, okay, I think well, we've... it might be. I just don't know what records we're talking about. So I, I, let's see and I'll reserve my objection. I think I gave you the ability to share your screen. And judge, it looks, I'm sorry, I got a new computer two days ago and it looks like I need to reauthorize my computer and quit to share. So I think I just need to restart Zoom for it to authorize it. Do you mind if I just do that really quickly? And then I think it'll just take five seconds for me to log back in. Sure. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. I apologize for that. All right, I'm gonna turn off my video while he's doing that. No worries, that was really quick. All right, so I'm going to share what 
I will tentatively call um, ES1, just for Aaron Sewell 1. Uh, this is the response to a subpoena that we sent to Audrey Courtney in Georgia. Um, we have attached to it a uh, deposition notice, as well as an authorization to release records. There is a letter that she has provided uh, that certifies that these are her complete records. And on the back of it, there is an affidavit of no records, and it references the letter that she sent. Um, I would just ask that, or I'd move to tender into evidence ES1 as uh, medical records from Audrey Courtney supported by a business records affidavit. Ms. Vickers, you're on mute. Uh, yes, Your Honor, I did receive this and I did waive the notice period for the deposition by written questions. So at this point, I don't have any objection. All right, so just briefly. Hold, hold on, let me admit it. So ES number one is admitted. And Mr. Connell, I'll need for you to drag this thing into the chat. So that way the, uh, this, you know, for me admit, to admit it into the record, I need to have it. So please, if you could please drag that into the chat. Do you know what I'm talking about? I most certainly can. Can I just finish with it? And then when I close my screen share, I can drop it right in. I yes. And, uh, and of course, Miss May, if I forget to tell them to do it, you're going to remind us, right? Okay. Yes, sir. All right, uh, Ms. Sewell, so it's my understanding that Peter was seen at Rivers Edge Behavioral Health Center in Macon, Georgia. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, and approximately when was that? That was, I want to believe, last year, between right at the end of the year. All right, and it was the therapist there that referred Peter to Audrey Courtney. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Is Audrey Courtney a specialist in diagnosis of autism and other um, psychological conditions? Yes, sir. All right. And did Audrey Courtney see Peter on or about March 29th, 2023? Yes, sir. All right. And did you arrange this because you were concerned about making sure that your son got the appropriate treatment? Yes, sir. Is part of why you did this also that Peter's primary care physician diagnosed him with autism? Yes, sir. I'm going to object to any testimony about what another doctor diagnosed him with, Your Honor. That's all hearsay. Judge, we're just we're just offering it for a non-hearsay purpose to explain her conduct of why she did this. We're not offering it for the truth of the matter asserted. Yeah, overruled, Ms. Vickers. All right. All right, Ms. Sewell. So um, did, she, did Peter ultimately meet with Dr. Courtney? Yes, he did. All right. But then she explained that after a consultation, she wouldn't get involved because she understood there was a contentious custody matter here so i had an appointment set for him to go in and start his therapy and everything and all his diagnosis and the day before he was supposed to go she gave me a call on the phone telling me she will no longer see peter due to the fact of this is a custody matter and that she will not do custody matters that people had been calling her and like I said, her harassed her in a way. All right. So Ms. Vickers asked a question, why about all this talk about autism? Why does it matter? Is it your position that it matters because you're trying to get your son to an expert who can properly diagnose him? Yes, sir. And you're committed to that? Yes, sir. And you've been trying for the past months to get him in to see a specialist and that can be difficult, correct? Yes, sir. There are typically waiting line, waiting lists and, and you know, you have to just be available whenever they have you come in. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. So again, Ms. Dool, um, you're just asking for your son to come back for a week before trial today? Yes, sir. Okay. 
I'll pass the witness, Judge. Uh, Ms. Vickers? I have no further questions, Your Honor. Ms. Harkins? I have no questions, Judge. <clears throat> All right, you may call your next witness, Mr. Connolly. Judge, I have no further testimony. Um, all right. And Ms. Harkins, do you have any witnesses to call or do you have a report from the amicus that I need to hear? Judge, I don't have any witnesses, but I can make a report. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Judge, I have um, seen Peter quite a few times now when he's come down. Um, you know, I have limited time to see him in person. So I really do try to make an effort to go over there and see him in his dad's home um, and see him interact with uh, Ms. McKnight, who we've heard testimony is also very involved. Um, and I also have spoken to his counselor. Uh, Ms. Sewell mentioned her name, Debbie Chambers, who has not seen him uh, anytime recently, but did refer him uh, for a, a assessment for autism. And um, Judge, really what I have to say is I haven't heard any testimony of how um, this recent uh, diagnosis or, or you know, investigation into whether he has autism would affect a visit down here in uh, Pleasanton. And, um, you know, it is true and no one's denying that Mr. Heddleston has gone quite a bit of time without seeing Peter for extended periods of time. And my main concern in all of the investigation that I've done is that Peter needs consistency and um, from what I can tell, his main trauma is the inability for his parents to communicate and co-parent. Um, and also, uh, I believe that it has not been good for him to go such a long period of time without seeing his dad. Um, and I do think that the transition between homes has taken will take a toll on him because everything that I've heard from both parents is that um, when he returns, to either home, um, it is a difficult transition and that is the hardest time. Um, as far as uh, Peter's communication with either parent when um, he's not with them, you know, the parties agreed for Peter to talk to the other parent, I think it's daily and that's hard. I mean, I have a five-year-old, that's difficult, especially for a video call. Um, and so I don't think, I, 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 from my conversations and just, observing Peter, I don't think that it, anything's going on in Mr. Huddleston's household that uh, makes Peter not want to talk to his mom and vice versa. I think part of it is a scheduling issue and he's having fun and he's getting disrupted. Um, so my main concern, Judge, is the back and forth. Georgia is far. Um, I know Mr. Huddleston has limited means um, and for Peter to go back and forth so much, um, I think that's part of the problem. So uh, my recommendation is for Peter to spend a significant period of time here with his dad, um, especially given that he missed out on a lot of time. Um, and the parties all know that I'm the one that initiated the recommendation of him to stay with his dad until the final hearing. Um, and I haven't heard anything today that makes me change my mind on that. Um, so that's, I, I don't see why that's not in Peter's best interest. All right, does anybody have any questions for Ms. Harkins? I don't have any questions. Mr. Connolly, you're on mute. I apologize, Judge. Just briefly, Ms. Harkins, part of your investigation is you spoke with Ms. Chambers, correct? That's correct. All right. And did what was her perspective on the matter? Uh, did she have any thoughts with regards to Mr. Huddleston's work schedule and who the child was with? Sure. Okay. So I, uh, I, I think it's important for context purposes to go back to the first time I talked to Ms. Chambers, which was in January. And at that time she had been seeing Peter quite a bit and, um, you know, she's the one who indicated to me that the main trauma is being ripped apart from both parents, uh, parent fighting and the need for consistency for him. And so I initially got that from her. And so I, I kind of tailored my investigation to that. Um, and then in my latest communication with her, I basically told her what I had recommended. I told her what the state legislature has determined is appropriate visitation for over a hundred miles. Um, and just gave her the whole rundown and included the fact that he 
I thought at that time had certainly been recently diagnosed with autism. Um, and so she said, I haven't seen Peter in a long time, but I know he loves to spend time with his dad. I can't see any reason why he couldn't stay the 42 days as long as dad doesn't use the CBD gummies, which is a past issue that has been discussed and that dad isn't working most of those days. So she did say that. Now, I know for a fact, Mr. Huddleston is gonna be working a lot of those days. So uh, I, my recommendation hasn't changed because I know he comes home at night. It's not like he's gone two weeks on, two weeks on. But that was Ms. Chambers' response to me. Yeah, nothing further for Ms. Harkins, Judge. Any follow-up, Ms. Vickers? No, Your Honor. Uh, do you now arrest Ms. Harkins? Yes, Your Honor. All right, a closing argument, Ms. Vickers? Well, Your Honor, <laughs> it, this is a very limited issue, but it it's... In the end, it'll be the crux of the case or part of the uh, a large part of the case. But I mean, we're talking about the 42 days as if my client is currently under an order that where he is the conservator with the standard possession over a hundred, a hundred miles. And he actually isn't. He's actually the still the primary custodial parent of this child. And we haven't had the luxury yet or the means yet to have the actual hearing on the motion to modify, which is not till July. Um, so while I understand the logic of using the 42 days, if he if my client has this child till the day of court on July 17th, when the decision will be made on the modification, he'll have something like 46 or 47 days instead of 42. So it's kind of like a the argument is, is kind of backwards because technically my client is entitled to possession under the current court order that hasn't been modified except for some interim temporary orders. Nobody's named joint managing conservator with the right to determine the child's residence except for him. And we have this huge period of time, and I get we're going to have to negotiate, we're going to have to deal with that at a merits hearing. There's a huge period of time where this child did not see his father through no fault of the father's. And now, now it's a concern that he's far away from his mom and he doesn't get to see his mom, but nobody seemed to be very concerned about that during the time period, a year and a half, whatever it was, that my client had zero contact while all the Georgia stuff was playing out. And so all I'm asking is that my client have a few extra days beyond the 42 day presumed standard possession order for somebody who has visitation over a hundred miles. I don't think under these circumstances, that's asking for a whole lot. There is no reason why autism has anything to do with that. We don't have any scheduled doctor appointments that are gonna be of great significance that I've heard about. We seem to have the excuse of, well, I can't get his medication. Frankly, I don't think that Ms. Sewell has worked very hard to determine whether or not that can be addressed. And I think it could be addressed. I am assuming Mr. Huddleston could certainly go to a doctor and the doctors could figure something out. I don't, there's people that travel all the time and get controlled substances and prescriptions for that when they're in a different location. So I just think that's a that's an excuse. Nobody has testified that anything untoward has happened during Mr. Huddleston's visits up to this point. And so I don't see why he can't have an extra few days for, for possession, given all of those facts, until we reach the merits hearing on July 17th and 18th. Mr. Connolly. Judge, we're, we're not here today to relitigate everything that preceded the filing of the emergency petition in Georgia, but a court there found that there was good reason to believe that this child had been medically neglected, and that is why they issued emergency jurisdiction. That is after picking up the child after he was with his father for an extended summer period of possession. I'm not here to argue about all that today. Uh, what I'm simply saying is First off, uh, I understand the position that we haven't had a modification, but I believe under the 1214 signed and agreed temporary orders, it specifically lays out specific possession periods for Mr. Huddleston. And on page three, it says 
undesignated periods of possession. Mom shall have him at all other times. She's not violating orders. She's just adhering to the agreed temporary orders that are in file. She has made the child available as soon as we got a call from Ms. Harkins and they said, let's do summer period of possession. First argument that we got was, hey, he'd get 42 days if he had the over 100 miles. We said, great, you know, this is a five-year-old who has been diagnosed with autism by a primary care physician. Another licensed professional counselor has referred him to a specialist to get a detailed diagnosis, which mom started working on, but that person couldn't finish or decided they wouldn't finish because they had gotten too many calls from lawyers and various other people subpoenaing records. And she just said, I'm not going to get involved in this. Uh, Mom is trying her best to make sure that the child is getting the care that he needs. That's what this is all about. Uh, she's trying to get him in to see another professional. Uh, she's not arguing that the child should have no relationship with the father or that um, he can't get any treatment in Texas. That's not at all what she's saying. What we have heard again and again from Mr. Huddleston is he just doesn't believe there's a problem with his son. He testified that in his deposition. He doesn't believe that he has autism and he hasn't done anything to take the child to try to get a professional to diagnose the child. Uh, what we're asking for is, you know, an opportunity to argue our case on the 17th. And by the own lot, the same logic that was given to us, uh, he can have 42 days. We would like the two uh, non-consecutive weekend periods of possession that are built into the family code on the same logic that was given to us or just some period prior to the final trial so that mom can see her son and it not be, you know, almost a month and a half of going away from the mom after he hasn't spent more than 10 days away from mom in two and a half years. That's the simple request that's before the court judge. And Ms. Harkins. I said most everything I had to say in my um, report. Um, I would just say that based on what Mr. Conley just said, um, I think it was me who initiated the summer possession conversation back early May. Um, and I, I didn't start with 42 days. All I said was, I think it would be good for Peter to spend a good portion of the summer with his dad from the time school gets out until the time that we come back for court. Um, I understand the argument. He's been there 10 days. Why, why suddenly let him go longer? But I haven't heard any evidence and I haven't seen any reason why he's happy here. I've seen him, I've seen him here and he seems happy. So, and from what Ms. Chambers told me, he wants to be with dad. He likes spending time with dad. Um, so that's why I've recommended what I've recommended. All right. I find that I have subject matter jurisdiction and jurisdiction over the parties in this case. I'm modifying the prior orders to include um, that if the mother gives a written notice by Friday, April, excuse me, Friday, June the 16th of 2022, the mother shall have possession of the child on any one weekend beginning on 6 p.m. on Friday and ending on 6 p.m. on the following Sunday. So, I mean, that's basically the extent of my order. It's sort of just the one weekend. We've all, And so I also need to add this. Of course, Father's Day weekend is is off the, uh, uh, can't be Father's Day weekend. So just sort of the standard, the standard possession or type order. So it can't be this weekend because it's Father's Day weekend. So uh, and just a little logic behind my ruling is like, we only really have four weekends to go here if we take out Father's Day weekend. There's not a whole lot. I don't think it's. I don't think it's be fair that we do. Either she's going to have. We don't have a whole lot of room to spread out these two weekends. So I'll just say one weekend is going to be enough. And yeah, just to clarify, by five p.m. on June sixteenth. Well, it just says that, in the in the standard possession order. It just says it just gives us a day. So if you okay. want to put a time on it, you can put a time on it. But uh, but in the standard possession order, it usually just says by April the fifteenth. That's sort of what I'm doing is just going by the same language that's in the standard possession order, but I'm just changing the date to June 16th rather than April the 15th. Okay. I don't Understood. Think it doesn't need to be time, I guess. <clears throat> I think it's just as long as before midnight, I think is what the family code would say. Yeah, I think that's that's it. But 
Okay, and now in regards to mediation, um, so Ms. Ms. Vickers, I sort of already heard Mr. Conley's motion for mediation. What is your position? Well, Your Honor, the issue with the mediation, there's a couple of issues. First of all, while I almost never uh, uh, oppose mediation, I think in this particular case, we have a parent that lives in Georgia. We have a parent that lives in Texas. That doesn't seem to be changing anytime soon. Mediation, the, the heart of mediation is compromise. Frankly, at this point, there seems to be very little room for compromise. Most of the traditional ways of compromising when people are arguing about primary conservatorship are not going to be in existence for this particular case. I also am concerned that scheduling mediation uh, in the next, basically at this point, 30 days, because we have to schedule it for a merits hearing, uh, because I certainly think that we can't use that as an excuse to delay the merits hearing um, would, I, I mean, and, and the other issue is, frankly, my client is of limited means and he doesn't, he, at this point, he doesn't have any money to pay for a mediator. And so I don't see the value in this particular case for mediation. Again, I don't, I don't, usually object to mediation, but in this particular case, I don't see that it's going to have a lot of value. And Ms. Harkins, do you have a position on mediation? I get both sides, Judge. I think the main, I would have no problem attending mediation, except one of the issues will be finding a mediator with time that suits all the schedules before the final hearing date. So far, the two names that I circulated, um, Mr. Conley, you don't know this, but we've lost some of the dates on their calendar already. So I think that will be tough. Um, but, you know, I, I always agree to go to mediation typically. So I see both sides. I understand there's not much middle ground is what I'll say. All right. And Mr. Conley, do you have, uh, I, I already sort of heard your motion, but since I just allowed them to argue, I'll allow you to argue again. Sure, Judge. Thank you. Uh, we had pulled some dates for a couple different mediators, and I had sent those to Ms. Harkins this morning. It sounds like some of those might have fallen off. But, uh, you know, I, I tell clients all the time, you know, at mediation, you have all the control. At trial, you have no control that a judge is going to make the decision for you. And, you know, like I said, I took Mr. Huddleston's deposition. He sounds like a reasonable guy. You know, I am always sort of optimistic that there is an ability for two people to come to an agreement. I think it's it's better if you can come to an agreement, uh, but I also understand sometimes we just have to try cases. Uh, I, I personally think it would be worthwhile. Uh, it's in the local rules that every case needs to go to mediation. Uh, and if not, you need to get clearance from the judge to basically bypass it. Uh, so I'm not trying to delay anything. Uh, we certainly want a resolution to this case in July as well. Um, but if if there's a, an ability, particularly David Willis, it looked like had some dates in June and early July. Um, you know, I, I always believe it's a good thing for parties to go through that process. All right. But Mr. Conley, I think the 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 gist of Ms. Vickers argument is that I don't think there's going to be any mediator that's going to convince your client that the child should live with the father. And I don't think there's any mediator that's going to convince Mr. Huddleston that the child should live with the mother. And if we can't get past that point, what else is there to mediate? I understand that's Ms. Vickers's opinion on the matter. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, is that your, I mean, are you telling me that your, your client would be willing to mediate to the point in which she would allow the, the primary conservatorship to remain with Mr. Huddleston and she would get some sort of visitation? I'm not in a position right now to say what she would or wouldn't agree to at mediation with regards <laughs> to something that's central. All right. Uh, I'd like to remain optimistic that with a good mediator that they can talk to both, that people might be flexible and open to certain proposals. Uh, but I just, I don't think I'm in a position to say what she would or she wouldn't agree to. Okay, then I'll ask her. Ms. Sol, can you unmute yourself? Yes, Your Honor. 
All right. My question to you is, will any mediator or any persuasive person be able to persuade you to allow the child to remain with Mr. Huddleston and he be the one that has the primary conservatorship of the child from this point forward? Honestly, Your Honor, no, no, sir. All right. And Mr. Huddleston, I'm going to ask you the same question. So unmute yourself. Will any mediator or any persuasive person be able to persuade you to change the current court orders to allow your child to live in Georgia and the mother be the primary conservator of the child? No, Your Honor. All right, I'm not going to order mediation because I just think if we have two people with no middle ground that were that mediation is going to be, uh, especially in this case where we have people that can't really afford the mediation, so I'm not ordering the mediation. And any sort of limit, and then there might be something about limitation of time. And the, if I remember correctly, in my standing orders, it says mediation must be ordered. And if you don't go to mediation, then you're that there are time limits on trial. So I'm going to remove. I'm going to amend the standard, uh, the standing orders to say that there are no time limits on the trial, and will remain set for a two-day bench hearing. Understood. All right. Anything else for the court to consider today? No, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I wish you all the best of luck as you prepare for trial. Thank, thank you. you Goodbye.